Hi, this is Tova Sherman, your host of Inclusion Revolution, welcoming you for another week of discussion around the importance of inclusion. Inclusion, who knows it better than me? Inclusion of persons with disabilities in our community and beyond. Today we're very pleased because often we have a lot of people asking a lot of questions around employment. In fact, it was Krista Daly, the CEO of Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, who mentioned to me recently that the majority of complaints they receive are employment related, those from persons with disabilities and beyond. So I really wanted to make sure we addressed that, that concern by bringing in someone who really knows what they're talking about, which is probably not going to be me. So welcome Brad Proctor from McGinnis Cooper. Thank you, Tola. Now Brad, I know that you are a labor and employment lawyer at McGinnis Cooper, but you're also specialized in, in giving um, legal advice to employers around employment practices or what we would call best practices around employment and inclusion of all of our community. So I really appreciate you being here. What interests me also is, Brad, that you're also a recruitment manager, uh, for a reg regional manager, excuse me, of recruitment and development, why I read, and you oversee the recruitment of lawyers for all seven offices for McGinnis Cooper. That's right. So you're really uniquely positioned from all perspectives to really understand understand some of the challenges that both employers and of course persons with disabilities across our community face in trying to feel that the e play you know the playing field has been equalized in order for them to feel appropriately engaged accommodated and included in opportunities around employment Th that's right uh, tova in, in the two hats that i wear at mcginnis cooper the one hat as a, a management side labor and employment lawyer is providing advice to employers with respect to the duty to accommodate and uh, accommodating during the pre-employment process but as well in the last few years as the manager of recruitment and develop development for mcginnis cooper i oversee the interviewing process for our seven offices in our four different provinces and i do a lot of the interviewing myself i know this year we did a approximately 250 interviews uh, within the month of January and uh, you know I, I did a number of those interviews myself so I kind of wear the hat as advisor to employers but also kind of the hat of you know HR person and and employer uh, in doing our own interviews for our own uh, uh, recruitment efforts. Well I actually look at that as, as being the most positive element of we, we could get a lawyer in, you know what I mean? That lawyer could talk from afar about these experiences, but having someone who does those interviews to be that person who also advises on best practices makes a tremendous amount of sense and frankly is one of the reasons I really wanted to speak to you today because you do have those two hats and you seem to be the right person to balance them because you're applying that knowledge in which you're you know, right. disseminating to other employers. So let's start with the basics. You made a comment about something called duty to accommodate. Yes. And I really think that's where it all begins in terms of confusion, and often disappointment on both sides when a person with disability, for instance, comes in to interview for a position and might require some accommodation or might just require some support in some of the preliminary testing. And what I wanted to first ask you is, in those simplest terms, and you'll forgive me, that's the only way I function, can you tell me what is duty to accommodate? Certainly, and, it, and the duty to accommodate comes from human rights legislation. So in Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act. And one of the common misunderstandings about the duty to accommodate for employers is that employers tend to think I don't have obligations to this person until they're my employee and that may be true with respect to common law employment rights but human rights legislation and the duty to accommodate applies before they are your employee so as soon as a person uh, you know basically approaches an employer and says I'm interested I've seen your ad and I want to uh, you know attend your interview or fill out uh, one of your applications human rights legislation applies and the duty to accommodate is engaged and I don't think most people know that because I think it's a little surprise, especially I'm sure to employers, but even those applicants, they're so used to getting, uh, frankly, my clients are really quite used to getting a no based on some of the, you know, realities of the attitudinal barriers we face as persons with disabilities and the stigma that's developed. So I think it's a really important message just to let both uh, persons with disabilities and employers aware that that duty really does begin from that interview process right. or even the ad process or am I going back too far? No, it begins from the ad process. And uh, if you read uh, stuff that's publicly available on the internet, you'll find different human rights commissions will advise employers that you have to be careful where you advertise. And are you being inclusive in the manner in which you advertise? Are you advertising in a certain type of publication that might uh, appeal only to a certain gender, a certain ethnicity? And so you really have to be cognizant about where you advertise, what you say in your advertisement. Sure, I know I teach a disability awareness training to employers across the country. 
specifically on hiring and retaining. And I, I, I touch a lot on the job ad and the, the reaching out, more because it makes sense than, I, than it was duty to accommodate. But seeing how it's also, in your mind, a best practice for any employer, I think it's really, really exciting to hear that because it's not just me believing we need to start screening in, not screening out, which is sort of for those right. HR people, what they certainly taught, were taught in uh, university was to screen out. You know, I'm of the school of screening in and allowing for different types of experience and how we attained it and volunteerism and all kinds of ways that we've come to our, our place to be a candidate. Do you advise at all employers around the idea of making sure that they're not screening out to the point of perhaps again not meeting that duty to accommodate? Certainly uh, and the duty to accommodate is one of those things it's um, many times employers will call us as, as a lawyer and they'll want an answer uh, that is a yes or no answer and unfortunately in, in labor and employment law and specifically in human rights there's a lot of gray area and the duty to accommodate is uh, it's, it's not limitless in the sense the law says that employers have a duty to accommodate so accommodating some differential characteristic about someone to the point of undue hardship so there is a limit on the duty to accommodate and you know once again employers they don't think of the duty to accommodate as a process but it is a process and you have to think well, what is the point of undue hardship and I always say to to uh, employers they say there's two words there undue hardship so it's not just hardship some hardship is expected, but it's undue hardship. And so once employers start getting their How head around that... How do you define that? that, though? I mean, that sounds very abstract to me, maybe because that could mean so many things in my mind. But obviously the law has to not leave it so gray, because that's, to me, a very vague term. I mean, yeah. is it, or is there a struggle around that, or is that pretty clear when you get into the legality of it? You know what? It's not, it's not an absolute, and it's not a yes or no, and I think we can say gray area or vague, and those types of things do apply uh, you know, to undue hardship in the sense that uh, it is a process. And it's not one of those things that you know, usually uh, you can do in one day. Uh, and it's one of those things that uh, there are a number of factors that can get you to undue hardship. Uh, and I always say, if you are XYZ incorporated with three employees, then accommodating someone's two-year absence is probably going to get you to undue hardship. You know, you've only got three employees. But if you're ABC Industries and you've got, you know, a thousand employees, then accommodating that same two-year leave of absence is likely not going to get you to undue hardship. Uh, and so those factors really depend on the size of the workplace, the cost to that employer, which is once again relative to the size, uh, safety factors, if there are safety issues, Issues. If someone wants to do a certain job and their limitation or restriction causes a safety issue for them or for a coworker, that can get you to undue hardship. So it, it, is, it is ambiguous, it is vague, but if you look at it as a process and if you look at it as uh, working through and looking for some of these things, then you can either determine that you can accommodate which is what most employers want to do, or if they can't, then they're at that point of undue hardship. Right, and that's why they really do need to speak to someone like you and learn from someone like you, because I think that I've met so many employers who've had a different understanding of terms like undue hardship, which means when I'm aggravated, it's undue hardship. Right. You know, and I've also seen some errors on that side. But for the person with disability who's going into that interview, presuming we've gotten past the, the issue of mm -hmm. the ad, and it's a wonderfully inclusive ad potentially, I haven't seen a lot of those, but let's, let's give the benefit out there. And then, you know, that person does apply and identifies at the interview. I do have a disability, for instance, let's use a simple example like visual impairment, and I just need extra natural light. So I'd like to be by that window, if you don't mind. That would be my accommodation. Now, something like that would be very simple in terms of, I would think, you know, the accommodation yeah. of it. But frankly, uh, there's a lot of often people not understanding what's happening. Now, in a situation like that, would you have any concerns around um, uh, anyone coming back and going, that's really hard because my staff is upset about it? Like, does that fall in under you know, All of those factors do play in. And one of the things, you know, you know it's interesting, what we'll often see is, um, is a person who doesn't disclose a, a limitation or restriction during an interview. And there could be a whole host of reasons why they don't. Perhaps they don't know about their restriction, limitation, right. because they're not in the job yet, and they may know, geez, I've got this condition, but they may not know it causes them to miss a certain number of days of work. At that or, point, they may not have that information. Or they're not able to, able to process a certain function in the workplace as fast as others. They may not know, so right. they may not disclose that, that, that restriction, or they may not want to. They and may that's a really big point, and I'm going to stop you there, because when we come back, 
here on Eastlink TV with Inclusion Revolution. I want to speak about the fact that many persons with disabilities are fearful to disclose and that's definitely one of the barriers that we're facing in identifying the challenges between employers and potential employees. So we'll be right back with Brad Proctor here on Inclusion Revolution.